Praise the Lord. I'm Dr. Byron Brazier, pastor of the Apostolic Church of God. As we journey through our day, it is important that we start at the throne of grace. And we do this every morning, Monday through Friday, in what we call courageous prayer. Tune in daily at 7.30, 8 o'clock or 8.30 for a short teaching and prayer to help us begin our day. It only takes 10 minutes of your day each and every morning. Join us as we go before the Lord. Join us as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. May God bless you in Jesus' name. Apostolic Family, we know that the prayers of the righteous have much power and we're calling all ACOG family members to come together for corporate prayer as we prepare for the 92nd Bible Convention. We'll gather together as the Body of Christ on Saturday, April 20th, beginning at 9 a.m. in the Dorchester Sanctuary. And we'll let our petitions be known at the throne of grace. We'll be praying for our teachers and preachers, our youth and young adults. We'll bombard heaven with a mighty move and have a great expectation of a mind-blowing Bible convention. Family, we need you to be a part of this church prayer as we set the atmosphere for a wonderful convention. We're excited to share with you that you can now join Dr. Brazier and Courageous Prayer daily on Instagram at 7.30 a.m. You can still join the prayer on YouTube, Facebook, and our app at 7.30, and 8.30. We've just expanded our reach to include the IG crowd at 7.30 a.m. So tune in Monday through Friday, and let's continue to come together for prayer. Hi, I'm Crystal. I'm not only a member of the Apostolic Church of God, I am also a servant, whether it's ministering in dance with the liturgical dance ministry or with my sisters on the Sisterhood Connection Ministry or on the leadership committee for Servanthood Connection. Serving is what I do. The Apostolic Church of God is a church of grace, hospitality, family, and service. And I enjoy working with other servants as we work collectively together to spread the word of God through events, workshops, campaigns, and more. There are more than 60 ministries here at ACLG where you can serve too. Right, Kristen? That's right. And like Crystal, I'm a member of ACLG and I serve on a couple of ministries as well. I'm on the leadership team for the youth and young adult ministry, or Y2M as we call it. I serve on Grace Ministry and right here with Grace and Truth Media. Not only is it another opportunity to fellowship with others, serving is also very fulfilling. And we need you to come share your time and your gifts with one or more of the many ministries at ACOG. And signing up to serve is easy. Absolutely, Krista. I'm a member of Apostolic, and I also serve on the leadership team for YAM. And as you can see, we have many ministries at ACOG for our youth, our young adults, and our seasoned saints to serve. And we know that your gifts can be a great benefit to the church and the kingdom. So sign up to serve today. Just log on to our website, click the volunteer tab, scroll down, and click the Servanthood Volunteer Ministry application, then follow the prompts. Apostolic, we can't wait to serve with you.
Lord thanks. Did you hear that? The Servanthood Academy is now all the way live. The stewardship training and orientation is now on demand 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Now you have the leisure of completing stewardship training and orientation at your convenience. So scan the QR code or go to our website to complete your training today. If you have any questions, contact the Servanthood Connection Volunteer Ministry at 773-256-4184 or email us at volunteer at acog-chicago.net. It's all the way live. It's all the way live. Apostolic, are you interested in serving? Would you like to learn to minister and dance? Well, the Liturgical Dance Ministry invites you to our meet and greet on Sunday, April 21st at 11 a.m. in room 203 in the Dorchester. You'll meet members of LDM, including the leadership team. We'll share information about our ministry, the mission, and so much more. We're looking for youth and adults who want to learn how to celebrate the Lord and dance. So come on, Apostolic. Let's dance like David danced while giving God our great praise. Through the resurrection of Jesus, you now have received a transformation. You're not like you used to be. I don't care how you try to go back. You ain't that same one no more. Once you, once you have tasted of Jesus Christ, you're never going to be the same again. You might try to run, but run on. But the Lord's already got the hook in you. The Lord's already making ways out of no way. You might be hanging on the cross, but the Holy Spirit has already dealt with you. You might be in the worst situation you've ever been in, but the Lord is dealing with you right now. The Holy Spirit is dealing with you right now. The Holy Spirit is saying, I got you. All you have to do is recognize who I am. Give your life to me. I got you. I'll always have you. I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Lord, remember me. Praise the Lord and welcome to Empowered by the Word here at the Apostolic Church of God. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? It is so good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Uh, we had an awesome worship service and uh, communion, Lord's Supper, whichever word you prefer uh, as a church body. Both services were full, and we just thank God for the many souls that came forward to be saved. We thank God for our pastor, Dr. Brazier. Can we bless God for him? Uh, as well as our first lady evangelist, Mary Brazier. And I'm so happy to see Belinda and Shirley and Deborah and Gerald and Berdina and Lenore and Yogi. Uh, thank God for each and every one of you and for those who are coming in. And I see new faces. And to you online, we're grateful to you. And we always want you to come join us if you can. If you're working, don't lose your job. You can always watch us on demand. But if you're just at home chilling, come on and hang out with us. Commit to one Tuesday a month at a minimum to come and hang out. Uh, we have worship from 1030 to 11 uh, and our daytimers ministry is in charge of that and we got band and all kind of stuff going on. So please come and worship with us, study the word of God with us one Tuesday at 11 o'clock a.m. And the Bible tells us the man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So if you're hungry for the word, somebody shout, let's eat. Let's eat. Uh, Father, we come today to say thank you, to thank you for 
Resurrection Sunday, to thank you for a good Friday, to thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives in us and is a witness and a confirmation of our blessed assurance that we too will rise from the dead and spend eternity with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ right back on this planet. And so Lord, we pray today that you would feed us your word enlighten our minds and give revelation to our spirits, Lord, as we delve into this next series, Lord, asking that you would help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ. And we give your name the honor, glory, and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So RL, we are starting a new series. So I hope you got your hand out. Uh, they're at the back table. For those of you studying online, we put a link in the uh, comment section of the notes as well as the synopsis so you can download it and study with us. And you're going to need it <laughs> uh, for today and for all month long as we're going to go out there in the deep a little bit. I'm going to go out into the deep, but this month we're going to talk about a discerning spirit, a discerning spirit. Uh, so we talked about, uh, you know, a love for God's people. Uh, we talked about having a heart for God. And now the third part of this to close out is uh, having a, a discerning spirit. So a surrendered heart, a love for God's people, and now a discerning spirit. And those were the three things that pastor talked to us about in his New Year's Eve charge to us as a congregation. And so we are just extrapolating upon that. And a discerning spirit is really about how we align our spirits with what God is doing in our lives. We, we want to make sure that we are discerning, that we are judging, that we are assessing what God is doing in our families, on our jobs, in our church, in our lives, so that we can respond appropriately to what God is doing so that we can be in alignment. And today, uh, Belinda, we're going to talk about the language of the spirit, the language of the spirit. And again, uh, we're going to be out there in the deep, but uh, it's going to be OK because God wrote the same book. So um, so I want to start with languages shape our experiences. So I'm going to do a little philosophical drop in as I do every week. Since we got new people here, we kind of deal with a little philosophical theology before we get into biblical theology, because this is a Bible study. There's a Bible class. And Alan Roxburgh wrote this book called Missional. And you know I'm all about missional church, missional communities. And here in this section, I'm a quote from, he's speaking about how our worldview is shaped by our language. So that language shapes worldview. And he quotes someone by the name of Mark Branson. And here's what Mark Branson says. A community's imagination, its stories and practices, its history and expectations, these are created and carried by words that interpret everything. We are constructed by and live our lives in and through language not language as we have come to understand it as a tool, as positivism or propaganda, but more like a house of language. So Branson says that our imagination, our stories, our practices, our histories, our expectations are all shaped by language. And that's what I wanna pull from this is that language shapes our worlds. That's why he or she who controls the story controls history. If you control language, you control the culture because everything is language, right? Math is a what? It's a language. 
It's the language. So language shapes our lives, language shapes our worlds, because we spend the second, third, and fourth quartiles of our life responding to the language of the first 18 years. It's the first 18 years of our life that we react to for the rest of our lives because it is the language of our household. It is the language of our peer group. It is the language of the authority figures in our lives that shape us and form us one way or another. And if we're not careful, we will find ourselves repeating the negative language over ourselves that others have spoken to us or on the positive side, we will speak the language of affirmation that people have spoken over us. And so language shapes our experiences. And so we're going to look today at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. As we talk about the language of the spirit, and if we understand that language shapes our experience. How I experience life is determined by the language I find myself in, then the Apostle Paul is going to help us out. So, number one, our faith, Sister Yolanda, should not be in human wisdom. And somebody check Yolanda right close to man. She's asking for $500. Um, our faith should not be, she's on YouTube, our faith should not be in human wisdom. Y'all know that really gets me. So I scrolled through after we're done and look for these people to let them know. Um, but our faith should not be in human wisdom. First Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, it says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So now in chapter one, Paul tells them that the weakness of God is his strength and that the foolishness of God is his wisdom and we put God's weakness and God's foolishness in quotes because from the world's perspective God's way is foolish from the world's perspective God's way is weakness because Jesus died on a cross what sense does that make? How wise is that? How strong is that? And so now Paul is building on that. And he says that when I came to bring you, Antoinette, the gospel, I did not come with this grandiose language. I did not come to you with the gospel relying on all of my rhetorical training, all of my tutelage. He doesn't put down rhetoric. He doesn't put down public speaking, to use a more familiar term to us. He doesn't argue against being a member of Toastmasters. What he is saying is, I didn't come to you relying on everything they taught me in Toastmasters. I didn't come to you relying on all of the debate skills I learned on the debate team while I was at Yale or Harvard. I didn't come with that. He says, because for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he says, the language I came to you with was the language of Jesus and his crucifixion. He's saying, what I came to shape you with 
was not how impressive a public speaker I am, but I came to you to shape your life by telling you about Jesus from the village of Nazareth who was crucified on a Roman cross. So look how he's delving into this language of the spirit. Language shape our lives and our worlds. And Paul is saying, the language I came to you with is a language of Christ and the cross. All right, let's keep going. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness. See, see he's playing off chapter 1. That's why I gave y'all that update. I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he says now, I was with you in weakness quote unquote. I didn't come with the big words. I didn't come with the dictionary.com vocabulary, right? I came to you in weakness and trembling because I did not want my language to be a barrier or to be something that you were impressed with. So I wanted to remove Paul and his Ivy League education as much as he could. He said, I didn't want you to compare me to Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and Cicero and Homer. I didn't want him to get caught up in none of those comparisons. So I, as best I could, stripped myself of that language mechanic in order to help you focus on, watch this, not persuasive words of human wisdom. I didn't want you to be impressed by me pulling from people that think the cross is weakness. I didn't want to impress you with using the language of people who think the cross is foolishness. So I am trying to strip all of that out of my presentation so that your faith, your power would focus on the demonstration of the spirit. So notice the language I'm speaking to you is not intellectual, but it's spiritual and it's effectual, it's power. So I'm coming to you with a language of power. I'm coming to you in the language, which is today's lesson, of the Spirit. Because what Paul is telling me now, that there are two languages that shape our environment. One is the language of human wisdom. The other is the language of the Spirit. And so I have these competing dialects that are trying to shape me and form me into the experience that either human wisdom wants me to have or that the spirit wants me to have. Because if Mark Branson is right, that language shapes my experience, then either I'm going to be formed as a human personality by human wisdom the world's philosophy, the world's way of thinking, or I'm going to be shaped by the language of the Holy Spirit. And so what he's saying is that everything you experience from me, from the language that I communicated to you, was the language of the Spirit, which was backed up by the Spirit's power. Are you with me so far? And here's why he says it does this. Verse 5, that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So notice now that there is a comparison, Sonny, between wisdom and power. <laughs> and, and so as a believer, I have to choose between human wisdom in God's power. 
Because if I choose human wisdom, then I have to deny myself God's power. But if I choose God's power, then I have to deny myself human wisdom. And so the question is, which one do I want? Which one do I want to form me? Which one do I want to shape me? Because the pull from the previous two months, if I come to God broken, if I come to God as Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, and all the king horses and all the king's men, human wisdom, couldn't put Humpty back together. I need the power of God to put me back together because I've been dropped too many times. There's too many pieces of me scattered all over the place and I don't have the capacity to fix myself. And the people who we applaud and laud for their intellect are broken too, <laughs> all right? So, so when I'm reading Freud, and I'm not saying I don't benefit from them, but if I remember correctly, didn't he commit suicide or something like that? And so we, we have these people who the world lifts up, but they just jacked up as we are, right? These Hollywood movie stars and all these famous individuals, we come to find out they got decret dark secret lives, right? <laughs> Engaged in all kind of debauchery. We see one now that's being uh, uncovered, allegedly, all right? And, and, and so he says then, number one, that my faith, my confidence, my trust. Remember, faith is not wishful thinking. Faith is trust. It is confidence. And so I don't want to rely on none of the most lauded thinkers. I want to rely and trust in the power of God. And so point number one, Terry, is that our faith should not be in human wisdom. Now we're going to keep going, so we're just getting started. So keep your, keep, keep your shoes on tight. All right, number two, Shonda, our wisdom comes from the Spirit of God, and that's point number three. I'm not confused, all right? Um, our wisdom comes from the Spirit of God. Verse 6, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. So, so now watch what Paul does. He says, I didn't come to you with all this fancy language. I came to you in weakness so that you would see the demonstration of God's power, that you would see Christ and him crucified so that your faith and trust would be in the power of God. But I still speak wisely. See, he, he's now saying that don't, don't get it twisted, Sister Linda. I'm not saying I'm a fool. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not learned. What I'm saying is that your reliance and dependence should not be on a degree on your wall or the certificate you got, your GED, you know, that, that you got. Your faith, your confidence should be in that. He says, but I do speak wisdom to those who are mature. So who are the mature? He's talking about those who have been born again. So, so now he's parsing out people. He's separating camps of individuals because he's saying, I didn't come to you with wise words, but I do speak wisdom to those who have been filled with the spirit because I can only talk to a certain group of individuals. See, you're looking at my diction, you're looking at my language, you, you're looking at the breadth of my experiences when this was a whole power play from the beginning, but now that the power is at work in your life, I am have to elevate your level of thinking, but it's not a thinking according to human wisdom, 
It's a wisdom and a thinking that's according to the language of the spirit. So he says, I speak to you from a place of wisdom among those who are mature, but yet not the wisdom of this age, not the wisdom of the culture, not the wisdom of the world. Why? Because all of the people that you look to, Isaac, and want to be like and wish you could have their experience, they're coming to not. That's what it says. They're coming to nothing. So all of the folk that the world lifts up, the wise, the millionaires and the billionaires and the gazillionaires who are not born again, who try to shape the language of our lives, who are responsible for shaping the language of our world, Paul says, Isaac, do not envy them. Do not follow them. Why, Paul? Because they're going nowhere. They may have temporary gain, but it's not long term. And so because you consider yourself to be wise, you have to play the long game. See, people who really are operators, people who are really political, people who know how to play the game, play the long game. Because you will lose a battle to win a war, but short game people will win a battle to lose the war. And so we have to keep the bigger picture in mind. And Paul says, do not get caught up in them because I'm going to speak to you on a whole nother level of maturity. A whole nother level. All right, verse seven, go back and watch it later. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, so, so watch how he's doing it because he's getting slick with it. He says, now I didn't come to you with fancy wisdom, but I do speak wisdom to those who are mature, but not the wisdom of the world in which you live. Because here's what I do. I'm speaking the wisdom of God. I'm speaking the language of the spirit. And so the reason those who are held up can't understand and relate that their end is destruction is because we're communicating different languages. See, if I say, hola, señorita, como esta? Uh, me llamo Isaac. A donde vas? Yo voy a mi casa. Now, y'all looking at me like, what is this? He didn't, so Dr. Hayes didn't give him his medicine this morning. And, and, and so, so, so what Paul is saying is they don't understand what I'm speaking because I'm speaking a different language. They view it, you always view someone who is of a different language than you as idiotic. Do you speak a English, right? Do you, you speak a English? But when you go to France, they say, do you speak a French? You see, see, whenever you are outside of your context and you speak a different dialect or language, you become the oddball. So here in America, they come and visit as a tourist. You're looking at them like they the goofy. But when you go tour their place, then you look like the goofy. Amen. And so what Paul is saying is I speak to those who are mature, but not the wisdom of the world, because I speak the language of God. I'm speaking it. Let's go. I'm going to keep going with it so you get it because you ain't with me yet. We speak the wisdom of God. Watch this in a mystery. It's a mystery. A mystery is something that's there. You just can't see it. You just don't know it. 
So when I was speaking Espanol to you, I was communicating to you. You just didn't know because it was a mystery to you what I was saying. When I said, my yamo Isaac, my name is Isaac. Hola, senorita, hello, ma'am. Right? So once I take the mystery off, then now you understand what I'm saying. But Paul is saying, I'm speaking a wisdom of God in a mystery. So I'm talking English. I speak a English, but the English I speak a is not an English you can understand because the English is containing the mystery of the spirit. I told you. So he says the hidden wisdom of God ordained before the ages for our glory. So what I'm saying to you, Paul is saying, is something that was hidden but already planned. So if I come in here with a box that's wrapped up, it was already wrapped before I brought it in here. But you wouldn't know what's in it. Every year when you were a little kid, I don't care how poor you were, if there was a, a, a quarter wrapped under the tree, it was wrapped and you didn't know what was in it. But it was prepared. It was pre-wrapped before you saw it. It was a mystery to you, but it was not a mystery to your parent or guardian. They knew what they put down there. And Paul says, I'm speaking to you and spoke to you in a mystery the wisdom of God that was prepared in advance for your glory. So the language of the spirit is for your benefit. The language of the spirit is for your advancement. The language of the spirit is for your prosperity. Because he's talking to a people who understand glory as the glory of Rome. Glory is prestige, is fame. It's power. It's what all of us want to be, the lifestyle of the rich and famous. That's what glory is. And Paul says that God used language in a mystery reserved before time for your benefit, for mine, your glory, which, watch this, none of the rulers knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So he's saying that what I speak to you is not what they speak because if they could think on your level, they never would have crucified Jesus. But his death was a mystery. They thought they were getting rid of a problem, but all they did is release a problem for them because it was in his breaking that we received our blessing. It was in his death that we received our salvation. So the people who were hating on Jesus that thought if we kill him, we kill the king, we kill the hopes. All they did, Paul, Philippians 2, verse 11, God highly exalted him. And gave him a name above every name. So you did Jesus a favor by killing them <laughs> because now he don't have to hide who he is anymore because the mystery was revealed and Paul is saying I am telling you don't be so caught up with what the world is saying what the world is doing because they don't know the overlay for the underplay they don't see what's really taking place because it's foolishness and it's weakness to them but it's for your glory and for your benefit. Are you with me so far? All right, JW. Verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed those things to us through his spirit. So watch this. Paul is saying it's a mystery. The language of the spirit is a mystery. God had prepared it in advance for your glory, but the people of the world didn't know it, so they played right into his hands. 
They won the battle to lose the war. All right. They didn't know. But, he says, as it is written, they didn't know, even though it was written right in the pages of their own scripture, because they were devout followers, right, of the law of Moses and, 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 and the whole Torah, the whole Old Testament. They had it. And they kept saying, this ain't you, this ain't you, this ain't you. And what does Paul quote the Old Testament, which was the only Bible that they had, and he says, but as it is written, meaning God already had this plan in the works, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared. So God had some things prepared. Pre means what? Advance, in advance. So there were some things God had in advances, specifically our salvation. He says they didn't know it, even though they were reading it. They couldn't see it, even though they was reading it. They couldn't imagine, even though they was reading, he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities and chastisement of our pieces upon him and by his stripes we're healed. They couldn't see that that person was the man hanging on the cross. They couldn't see it. He says, but although eyes have not seen, although ears have not heard, even though the mind has not imagined, but God has done what? He did what? It's in your Bible, on your paper. God has revealed. God has revealed. A mystery is concealed, but God has revealed. Ah, remember, it was there. It was prepared in advance for our glory but it was a mystery. It was concealed. But Paul says God has revealed how? By the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the difference maker. The Holy Spirit is the decoder. The Holy Spirit is the translator because the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God breathed like a sail blown by the wind. Yes, he used Paul. Yes, he used David. Yes, he used Moses. Yes, he used Nehemiah, but he was blowing on them. Their intellect, their experiences, their backdrop, but his message. And the person that inspired it, that guided it, is the same person that can decode it. Because I wrote it. <laughs> I can tell you what it is I wrote. I hid it. And I know where I hid your Christmas present. Go back there in the closet, look behind your mama's suitcase, and it's going to be right there. All right. Amen, somebody. So he says, they see a wrapped box, but the Spirit shows you an unwrapped box, and we're both looking at the same thing. They see what they can't see. We see what has been revealed to us. So one sees nothing, the other sees what's there because it's been revealed by the Spirit. All right, let's keep going, Sister Laverne. For, he's telling us now why it's been revealed by the Spirit, explanation for the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him, 
Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit. So here we have the wisdom of God, which is a mystery, which is hidden in plain sight. It's like those little puzzles we have. You know, find the snake in the garden, and you looking all over the place, and you can't find that snake. It's there. It's hidden in plain sight. And then I have to say, Brother Elder, Elder Smith, where's this snake, man? I can't find it. He says, it's right there. <laughs> oh, man, how you find that thing? Paul is saying, he's revealed it by the Spirit, and here's how he does it. The Spirit searches. He's a deep sea diver. Now, this is figurative language, so don't, don't think the Holy Spirit out there in scuba equipment in Lake Michigan. The Holy Spirit is depicted as searching the wisdom of God. The deep things of God. So he not just going surface level. The Holy Spirit is going into the depths of God's mind, quote unquote. And you taught me in Sunday school that God is infinite. So there is no limit to the depths of God's knowledge. There is no limit to the depth of God's intellect. So the Holy Spirit is perpetually going deeper and deeper into the mind of God. He's going deeper and deeper into the hidden treasure that is the mind of God. And Paul is saying that the reason we can see what they can't see, the reason we can know what the world doesn't know is because the spirit is steady finding stuff and tagging stuff for our benefit. He says, now here, Isaac, you still slow. You don't get it. You went to a public school. Uh, you went to a state college. You know, it wasn't no Ivy League kind of stuff. So we, let, let me help you out here. He says, only a human can understand what happens in the human. That's why we have biologists. Uh, that's why we have neurologists. That's why we have orthopedics and all of these different types of people who study humanity to understand who we are because you know what you're thinking. I can't tell you what you're thinking. No, that ain't what you meant. How you gonna tell me what I meant? I, I know what I'm thinking. I might not have said it the way you interpreted it, but you can't tell me what I think. You can't tell me what I know. And so he's saying, just like you know what you know, you know what you're thinking, you know what your intent is, and everybody here who is married or has been married know exactly what I'm talking about. And usually it's one person whose gender, I ain't going to say today, that's usually the one that said, baby, that's not what I meant. <laughs> baby, that's not what I was saying. You not you not I don't know what you done, how you concocted that. That's not what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying. But it wasn't translated. And the more you try to explain what you meant, the deeper in trouble you get. Because you ain't getting out of it. So just say, yes, dear, okay, baby, and be done with it, all right? I want to keep you married. Yes, dear, okay, baby. Just get you two buttons. Yes, dear, okay, baby. That's, that's it. You don't have to say nothing else in your entire marriage. Yes, dear, okay, baby. You will be married till the Lord comes back. I can promise you. That's all you got to do. Yes, dear, okay, baby. He says, just like nobody can tell you what you're thinking, only the Spirit of God knows what God is thinking. See, all of these talk shows can't tell us what God is thinking. 
All of the talking pundits and talking heads on television cannot tell us what God is thinking. All of your friends can't tell you what God is thinking. All of those people who call in to the talk radio show can't tell you what God is thinking. They are giving their opinion. They are giving their biased perspective. But Paul says, these the same people that you listening to try and tell you, oh, God understand, it's okay. You can have a little fun. You can do this. Take care of your needs. You ain't got to go to church. You ain't got to read the Bible. God knows your heart. Those are the same people that Paul says, if they had known, they would not have crucified Jesus. He says, don't fall for the okie doke. That's what he's saying in the Ebonic translation. Don't let them send you off. He says, nobody knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Point number three, which is point four. Our language... Sister Belinda should be the wisdom of God. So point one, our faith should not be in human wisdom. Then he says the reason it shouldn't is because our wisdom comes from the spirit of God. And then he ends with this. Our language should be the wisdom of God. Verse 12. Now, we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also what? Speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things, and I will always help us out here with spiritual people. All right, so he says now, only the hum, only you know what you're thinking. <laughs> only you know what your intentions are. You may not communicate it effectively sometimes. You may not say it the way you wanted to. It, it didn't come out right, <laughs> you know, because we, we fallible. He says, but the spirit knows what God is thinking and what God has. And so now he says, now, here's his collusion, uh, conclusion. He's building us to the crescendo. We have not received the spirit of this world. The mindset is what he's talking about here. We don't have the world's way of thinking. We have not received the mindset, the ethic, the world view of our society. We have not received that, but what we have is the spirit which is from God. So the way you think and the way they think are different because you think like God. I didn't say you were God, so, so don't, 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 don't uh, take your jacket off yet <laughs> and say dun da da dun Superman, Superwoman, no. You think like God because you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God. Why, Paul? So that you might know the things that are freely given to us by God. So God has gave me some stuff. And Paul says it's prepared for me. That's what he says. He also told me that the Holy Spirit is searching for everything that has my name tag on it. If he see Reggie, that ain't for Isaac. I ain't got, I ain't worried about that. He see Wendell, that ain't my problem. He see the Maxine's name on it, ain't my problem. He see Gerald's name, ain't my problem. Sees Catherine's name on it, ain't my, I don't care nothing about all y'all stuff. All I want to know is where is my name tags? <laughs> you understand? God bless you. Happy for you. What, what, what stuff got my name on it, right? That, that's all we want to know when they read the will. What, what did they leave me? 
What did they lead me? That, that's all I want to know. And he says, I've not received the spirit of the world, but I got the spirit of God in me so that I can know what God has freely given me. I need to know what God has given me. Because it's right there in the Bible. But human wisdom ain't going to help me figure out that that belongs to me. Human wisdom is not going to help me understand what God has given me because I have not seen, ear have not heard, nor has my mind imagined what God has prepared. It's there, but it's wrapped. It's there, but it's in a treasure chest. And I need a key to unlock it. It's there, but I need a decoder. I need a translator to tell me what God has for me, and I'm meaning us collectively, what God has for us. So he says, I need to know that. And the way that I do that is that the spirit comes to me. And watch this. Once I begin to get a revelation of what the spirit is revealing to me, as I am studying the word of God, then I begin to speak a different language. My vocabulary changes. Because now I am a foreign national. <laughs> Remember, I am in this world, but I'm not of this world. I am a citizen of heaven even though I live on earth. And so now the spirit is saying, say, ah, ah, be, be, se, se, de, de. See, you learn, oh, good boy, good boy, Isaac, you're learning the language. Say cat, cat, oh, that's a cat. Look, look at that right there. Say dog, d -d dog, yeah, oh, oh, that's a dog. Yeah, put a little cord. Oh, McDonald had a fun. Yeah, yeah. So I'm learning the language of the spirit because I'm speaking a language. Watch what he says. Not in the words that the human wisdom teaches. I'm not speaking the language I was brought up with. Because the language I was brought up with damaged me. The language I brought up with caused me to be malfunctioned, <laughs> caused me to be deformed and defunct. And so because I come to God damaged goods, that's why he has to tell me he loves me with an everlasting love. Because when I sin, my language house is that my father's going to knock my head off because I disappointed him. Right. If, if I don't make this the right way and clean the restroom the right way, then my mother's going to fuss at me. So part of my world experience is this tyrannical authority figure. Right. In my world, I've had people misuse me. So they told me they loved me, but the way they loved me was abusing me. So I come to God hearing the same words, but they're not the same thing <laughs> because he's now helping me understand as he puts the broken pieces back together, the language of the spirit, because the language of the spirit is not the language of love that discards you and abandons you. It's the language Ezekiel that finds you bloodied and discard it by your parent. And what does Ezekiel say? I took you and I cleaned you off and I adorned you in royal garb and I made you somebody. See, so the language he says is what God has for me is not the rejection that I experienced in the past, but that I am accepted into the beloved. 
that I am the pupil and apple of God's eye, that I may have grow up poor and I used to have the tongue of my shoes flap and I would go for a walk with my friends to the store because I couldn't buy anything. But now in Christ, I have all that I need because he's going to supply it. Right. So I understand a different language. And so what Paul says Belinda, is that now my language has to change because I'm comparing spiritual things with spiritual people. I'm now talking to the mature. He's taking us back now to verse six. He says, but we do speak wisdom among the mature. See, I'm talking to spiritual people now. And by spiritual, I don't mean oh, I'm spiritual, not religious. No, I'm talking to people who are spirit filled, <laughs> people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, who have been born again because your religious in being spiritual and not religious don't mean you're born again. That doesn't mean you don't want to conform to what Christ has mandated. And so you use that as an excuse to be disobedient. <laughs> but we learned last week that you have to walk in obedience to speak the language of love. And so if we're walking in the spirit as he is in the spirit, then we have fellowship. And so he says, now I got to have a different level of conversation. My conversation has to be with people who speak my language. Because me trying to argue with you while I come to 11 o'clock Bible class is never going to translate on your end. I don't I can talk to her, I'm blue in the face. All you hear is a Don De Vos, K. T. Arrow, right? Quantus Anjos Theanus Tu. That, that, that's all you're going to hear. How old are you? Uh, you, 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 don't, you don't know nothing I'm saying to you because you don't speak the language of the spirit. So I'm trying to tell you all the blessings I have and you can't relate to that. I'm trying to tell you that Jesus is alive and well, and you can't relate to that because it's foolishness to you. It's weakness to you. And so Paul says now, because we have received the translator, because we have received the decoder, we now have the ability to understand the language of God, the wisdom of God, and now we gather together and find people who speak our language so that we can encourage each other. Because I don't want to keep arguing with you fools. You know, I come over there, have some barbecue with y'all, watch the game. I'm out, holla at you, peace to the chief, love to the gov, you know. But, but, but after that, I'm gone because you gonna make my blood pressure rise and I, I don't need to have that happen right now. So I got to find so Sister Isom so that I can talk about the language of the spirit. So, so what's, the, what's the big idea? I done chewed up all my time. He says, but the natural man, I'm sorry, I got a few more verses. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. I went ahead of myself, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, and meaning spirit filled, not y'all spiritual, not religious folk. Yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have what? The mind of Christ. So he says, we, the reason we gather together to have a spiritual conversation with spiritual people is because your friends and family and the folk on TV who don't know what they're talking about can't know because it's foolishness to them and it has to be discerned. And that word discern means to judge, to assess. It has to be evaluated by the Holy Spirit. And they don't have the Holy Spirit to evaluate what they are hearing. They're processing it with their human mind, but we just read, I have not seen, ear have not heard, mind have not imagined. 
So we're asking broken people to understand spiritual truths. And it's impossible because they have broken mechanics. We got broken mechanics. The difference between us and them is we got the translator, capital T. We got the one who can explain it to us, not explain, but explain it to us, okay? And so, because they're spiritually discerned, but he who is spiritual and judges is the same word in the Greek for discern, discerns all things, yet he himself judge no one. So, for the record, mark this, underline it. The next time somebody tell you you can't judge them, say, no, Paul says, I can judge all things. He didn't say I could judge all people. But he says, he who has the spirit of God can judge, evaluate, assess all things. So lying is lying. I can call that out. I ain't got a hell of heaven to put you in. Adultery is adultery. Fornication is fornication. Still, Paul says, he that has the spirit, she that has the spirit can judge anything. So they don't judge not lest you be judged. That didn't say don't judge. It say if you do judge somebody, be prepared to be judged. See, you leave that part off. Lest you be judged. But Paul says, taking all of scripture, not one scripture, he that has the spirit, do, do judge. Watch this. But you can't judge me, boo. Because he says, yet he himself is judged by no one. So the person that don't have the spirit, I can judge your actions, but you can't judge me, boo. Y'all got too quiet on that. <laughs> Say that again. Watch it. He that is spiritual judge all things. And he who is spiritual doing the judging of all things, no person can judge them. All right, I'm going to go back and watch it later. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Who going to tell Jesus what he can and can't do, that he is and ain't right? Now, you might tell your husband, your, your wife, your, your, your son, your daughter, your nephew, your brother, your sister, but you can't debate Jesus and tell him what he meant. But watch this, and we're done. He says, you have the mind of Christ. So you get to speak for Jesus. So don't you sit back and cower. You have the spirit who gives you the thought process of Jesus. That's why I say you think like God. All right, what's the big idea? I got one minute. The language of the spirit is the spiritual wisdom of God spoken by believers in Christ by means of the spirit. What I want you to know today, walk away with, because I told you it's going to be deep and we're going to keep going deeper each week, is that God has a language. And in order to understand God's language, you need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will tutor you how to speak like God. So here's the challenge. Are you speaking the language of the world or the language of the Spirit? And I want you to commit to setting time aside each day to learn the language of the Spirit through Scripture and prayer and then to speak that language with other believers. You got to read the word to understand the language of the spirit and you have to spend time in prayer to hear the voice of the spirit. That's why I'm saying you read the word, but you got to know when God is speaking to you because God will speak to you in the middle of a conversation. I have a family member, I don't know if I told you this, I might have, that was driving home on Stony Island or going somewhere on Stony Island. And the Lord told them, stop at that light. They were going to run the yellow light. And the Lord told them, stop. And they said, I was arguing with God why I got to stop at the light. They said, I'm arguing with God but the Lord stopped the car, stopped the car, don't run that yellow light. And they listened to God. 
and the car in the far lane ended up coming right across and hitting another car. Had they went through that yellow light, they said I'd have been killed. And my point is, why did they stop? Because they knew the language of the spirit. Now, God might have said that to the person in the car next to them, but they didn't know the language of the spirit. And so I'm saying the way you learn to understand God's voice, how do I know when God's speaking to me? That's one of the top questions. Well, you know how, when, how God is speaking with you if you take time to hear God speak. And you do that in prayer. Prayer is more than Lord give me, Lord bless, Lord do this, I'm out of time. It's stopping to listen, and the more you listen, the more in the midst of chaos. You could be at, uh, at a Travis Scott concert, and you can hear God speak in all that noise and chaos. If you know his voice. Because if your mama spoke, you hear her voice in all that chaos. So you got to learn language. I'm out of time. There may be someone here who has not given their life to Jesus Christ. If we want to extend to you an invitation to put your faith, your trust, your confidence in his son, Jesus. The way we get his spirit is to put our faith and trust and confidence that he is God's son coming to this world to die for our sins. That's what Sunday was all about. It's not about Easter bunnies and dying eggs and getting Easter baskets and buying your children or grandchildren new suit, new dress. It was about and is about Jesus Christ's historical bodily resurrection from the dead. And if you trust and believe and have confidence in that event and in him, then all you have to do is get out of your seat and come down this aisle and give your life to Jesus so that you can receive the spirit and then you can begin to speak the language of the spirit. For those of you who are studying God's word with us online, we welcome you to our Bible study. We are so grateful to God that you are studying the scriptures with us. There are so many great teachers and churches out there. Uh, there are a dime a dozen online, but yet you are studying with the Apostolic Church of God. And we just thank God for you. And we want you to give your life to Jesus if you have not yet put your trust and confidence in him. The Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart and if we declare out publicly that Jesus Christ is God's son who was raised from the dead, that we are now in a relationship with God. And we want you to say it, to believe it, and then to tell us of your decision so that we can begin to take this journey with you. So email us, call us, let us know that you have given your life to Jesus Christ uh, and we will praise God for you and God willing, praise God with you right here at the Apostolic Church of God. Are you here? Is there one? We never assume because you come every Tuesday you saved because there's always somebody who is still wrestling with that decision. Sometimes it takes us 10 visits. Sometimes it takes us 10 years. And so that's why we do this every time we gather together because we never know when you will have that breakthrough to say today is the day that I'm gonna finally make that decision and give my life to Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that you are giving us a discerning spirit so that we can speak the language of the Spirit. We pray and give you honor and thanks for the souls that have given their life to you. We ask that you would fill them with the Holy Spirit as you have promised, and that you would help them and help them to work 
and to walk in the newness of life. We pray, God, that as they grow in their faith, that they will find a local church that they can connect to so that they can be discipled to be able, Lord, to go out there and to have impact for your kingdom. And we'll give your name honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give God a hand clap of praise? And I just want to give someone one more chance. If you're here, to come. It's never too late to get out of your seat and to come down the aisle and to give your life to Jesus. You know you need them. That's why you're here. You surely ain't coming to hear me. <laughs> so, so, so you're here because you recognize that you need Jesus in your life. And that only comes by getting out of your seat Give your life to him. Amen. It's now offering time at the Apostolic Church of God. We thank God for Sheree and Laverne and Belinda, Brenda, Gloria, Lenore, Diane. Uh, please give as God has prospered you, Sister Regina Richardson. Give as God has prospered you. This is an important part of our worship. This is an important part of the language house of the spirit because our giving is part of our language. If mathematics is a language, then our finances are a language. And it tells God our level of trust, our level of appreciation and thanksgiving, because we understand it's his. If, if we can ever get to the point we recognize all of this is God's, and all we are are managers, all we do is manage God's money. And he tells us, that to the ability we manage it, the more he'll give us. We give not to get back. We give because we already have, but because of our faithfulness in the language of our financial stewardship, he gives us more because he knows he can trust us with more. And so give as God has prospered you. The tithe is 10% of your increase. The offering is anything and everything above that. You can do text to give. You can do online giving at our website, acogchicago.org, or you can do a check or cash. But everybody needs to participate in today's act of worship. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you sent your son into this world to die for our sins. And we thank you that in your wisdom and in his weakness, was your wisdom and your power. And we thank you that as he got up from the grave, we too will get up from the grave. And we thank you that he is in charge of your treasury. And in being in charge of your treasury, he increases our financial well-being to give to the church so that the operations of the ministry may take place. So Lord, we pray that you would bless today's tithes and today's offering, multiply them 100 fold for the use of your kingdom and Lord, out of the bounty of your harvest, return it back to us 100 fold for our own personal use. And we give your name, honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, please come forward. Only a couple of announcements today, or three, because couples only two. One, our youth Bible class tomorrow, six o'clock via Zoom. Please sign them up. Um, that number should be much more than what they tell me they're getting. It's increased, um, but there's a lot of children and grandchildren in this room that need and great grandchildren that should be on there. It's only one hour. And they listening to, uh, to all these other people who I ain't going to name right now, giving them a different language, what we call language house. But we want them to have the language of the spirit. So make them, make them get on here and be a part of this Bible class. It's only two months, two days out the month right now. So please let them do that. And then tomorrow night is our Bible class, 7 o'clock p.m. in-house online. Join the pastor. He will be teaching uh, to us. And then don't forget our Bible conference, 92 years. We were founded on January 17th, 1932, 8 West 57th Street, third floor apartment. And God has brought us here to the church we are today by his grace. And so we got some powerful speakers. We got Dr. Cosby. We got Dr. E. Dewey Smith. 
We got Bishop Walker. Uh, we got Marissa Farrow, who was a preacher. Uh, we got Bishop, uh, who was the second preside, a vice presider, Bishop Tolbert, on Friday, among a host of other speakers. So make sure you are here, because we're going to have church. And we're going to have some show enough church as we talk about Rise Up in the Saturday before. I know it's not on there, but I believe that's the, whatever, the 20th. We're going to have our pre-convention prayer. It's going to be our first quarterly prayer. A lot of you have been saying, Elder Hayes, when are we going to have the Saturday prayer? Well, we're starting back quarterly. It used to be every month, but we're going to start back quarterly and ease into it. But that will be the first quarterly prayer. So they, they're going to have us walking all around the building and everything. So put on your sketchers or whatever you wear uh, to walk around. We're not coming to sit and watch people pray. We come in to pray together uh, and, and anoint the sanctuaries of God, the house of God for the Bible conference. So make sure you keep those announcements in mind. And I will bring up now uh, Brother Williams. See you next uh, week. I don't know what we're talking about, uh, but we will be talking about a discerning spirit. So God bless you all. See you later. Praise the Lord. Can we give Dr. Hayes a wonderful praise hand clap? for delivering the word, amen. And now in this order, we're going to have uh, special announcements uh, by the events team, funeral announcements, and then the closing prayer and benediction by Minister Reggie Smith, Sister Beverly Queen Thomas. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we made an announcement about uh, honoring uh, Dr. Um, Hayes, and we said that the the uh, event was going to take place on June twentieth. I think that same day we got a email saying that we can't have that on that day, so we are changing that date to the uh, July eighteenth, Thursday, July eighteenth. So please mark your calendar because we do want this um, banquet hall to be filled with all of the daytimers as we honor him as he has made a big, big achievement. And then also for those of you who ordered the Black History t-shirts, if you will remain about five minutes after service, we will issue those shirts today. God bless you all. Again, praise the Lord, saints. Our lineup for services this week is on Wednesday, April 3rd, there is a service here in the Kenwood Sanctuary for a Earl Grant. That week will begin at 10.30 a.m., the service at 11. On Thursday, April 4th, there is a service here in Kenwood for a Darius Collins. That week is at 10.30 a.m., the service is at 11. On Saturday, April 6th, there is a service. It begins at 11 a.m. The funeral services begin at, the wake is at 11, the service is at 11.30. That service is going to be held at the Indiana Avenue Pentecostal Church at 3520 South Indiana. It is from the family of our beloved assistant pastor, Ronald Smith. Also on April the 8th, here in Kenwood, there is a service for a John Davis. The week will begin at 10.30 a.m. Service will begin at 11. That is all the announcements I have at this time. Thank you. Praise the Lord to you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Could we stand for closing prayer and the benediction? Father, we, we come today to give your name praise, glory, and all the honor. We love you, we honor you, we glorify you. Help us, Lord, to be more discerning of your spirit. Help us, Lord, to understand the language of the spirit. Help us understand it, not just hear it, 
but be obedient to it. We thank you for our assistant pastor and, and the words that he gave us, the, the teachings that he's rendered to us. I want you to restore to him, Lord, that which he's given out. Help us, Lord, to be more like you. Bless us, Lord, in all we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. And now the benediction. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And all of God's people said, amen. Bless you. Turn off the mic for me, please.